I'm Eddie Conway. Welcome to The Real News. I'm down at the Federal Court Building in Baltimore City right now, and they're hearing an issue in Federal Court about juvenile life. At this hearing, the judge was hearing arguments about whether or not she should allow our lawsuit on behalf of juveniles serving life with parole sentences to go forward. And in the hearing, the state presented its arguments about saying that basically, you know, there is no case, everything's fine, it was never broken, and we've also fixed it. I'm here to be of su some support for my brother, mm -hmm. my brother Sean Blount, which had been locked up for 33 years. Mm -hmm. As uh, I wasn't single, but in actuality, I was single because I had to do everything. You know, I had to work, I had to maintain a family, I had to maintain a home. But I also had a husband that needed my support, you know. And I also believe in Allah, I believe in God, you know, who's the powerful one who gave me the strength. Well, I'm sitting here with people that has spent a tremendous amount of time interacting with the criminal justice system in the Department of Correction here in Maryland, and they're down here to support the case for the release of the juveniles. So I just want to get a sense of what this means for them and what they think is going to be the outcome. I'm here with uh, Wayne Bruton's wife, and we have him on the telephone. He's down at the Jessup Correctional Institute. Uh, in Maryland, and he is one of the people that has been organizing around the uh, conditions of lifers, uh, juvenile lifers, and so on. What was uh, originally our policy has morphed into a de facto uh, life without parole. And so why this, why, why, why this case is important because of the politics that's been involved in the process. One, how does this juvenile life uh, case affect you? Does it affect you? Uh, yes, it, it, it affects me. And the, it, it, the hurry is that in the last 25 years, they had not had a juvenile life that's been paroled in the state of Maryland. I've had to parole a substance parole her. As a matter of fact, I was in the process and wanted you to pre release work in these programs, but it's suspended. We are very supportive of all lifers juveniles and otherwise, um, but we today um, really understand more importantly our forefront in being where the women are concerned because this is something we talk about every day. We talk about how we never see any impact done for women who are incarcerated, right? They're all women, many of them who have life sentences, right? Uh, women have gotten a, a, a worse deal because they are not acknowledged and because I am a woman of worth, I see myself as, as a soldier and so therefore I struggle in the war with the brothers as well. So how old were you when you got locked up, Wayne? I was 17. Okay, and so how long ago was that? How long have you been in the prison system? 38 years. 38 years. So under normal circumstances, you should have got parole when, 20 years ago? Yeah, roughly 20 years ago. Okay, and how many times did you go up for parole so far? I've been up for parole two times. In and 1992... Okay, I what happened? I was recommended for lesser security. I was recommended for lesser security, and I was in the process of going into the pre-release work release system. Uh -huh. Into uh, the former governor Glenn Denny suspended the work release program and suspended parole for all licenses, not only just juveniles, but all licenses in the state of Maryland. And I just went up again uh, November the 14th. And what happened? And was recommended for a uh, risk assessment and. I was told by the two commissions that my paper would be sent to the inbox or I would be sent to the camp system, which they just recently reinstated for juvenile offenders. However, that's going to affect to the end of 2017. It's not just international law. Our contention is that the Eighth Amendment, the U.S. law, the U.S. Constitution, mm -hmm. um, treats as cruel and unusual punishment 
man, you know, life without parole for kids, except in the most rare circumstances. Mm -hmm. The Supreme Court has said that, and it reflects. I think it's a it's an opinion that's consistent with sort of international human rights and basic rights. Um, framework. So there's of course a moral argument, but there's also a constitutional argument, which means that what the st our allegation is that what the state's doing is illegal. It violates the Eighth Amendment. How old was he when he got locked up? He was 15 and a half. He was 15 and a half. Yeah. And so he's been in jail, you say, for 33 years. He, he was 16 years, years old. He'd mm -hmm. been locked up for 33 years. Okay. And yes. have he ever went up for parole? He'd been up a couple of times and he what? was set back to come back. And also he went up in 2015 and he was waiting, so he's waiting. So we're hoping right now that he be one of the ones that get a chance to be released. I spent 44 years in prison myself yes. with your brother yes. and, and the rest of the guys, right? But I can't imagine how this must be to somebody outside that you grew up and you got a brother and all of a sudden he disappears and he's been gone for your entire adult life? Well, it was traumatizing for me because mm -hmm. we're a year apart. We're very close. We're still close. We're a close-knit family anyway. And we was very traumatized about him being wrongfully accused, mm -hmm. you know, at that young age. Mm -hmm. We was thinking that he was coming home, but he didn't. Mm -hmm. You know, in the process of him being locked up, incarcerated, my mm -hmm. mom and dad passed away. They was hoping for him to come home. You know, we nieces and nephews, siblings, all of us are rooting for him to come home. We miss him. We love him. He's very supportive and there. Well, uh, is this, this, you, you're talking almost four decades. Uh, how Has this impacted your family? Absolutely. Absolutely. Sometimes we, 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 we tend to forget that when we come into these prison systems, that we bring our whole family with us. You know, it, 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 it's just through the grace of God that I have a wonderful wife, Vicky, who, who support me wholeheartedly. I have good family support. I have, I, have, I have good friends. And that's my motivation now. That's what keeps me going. That's what keeps me strong. Okay, well, your, your wife is God here today. right like, now, sitting beside me. I'm just going to ask her a couple questions. Um... Have this been a hardship on you, and, and, and exactly what kind of hardship has it been, if that's so? Yes, it has been a hardship on me. Um, it's, it's times when, um, for instance, his mom passed, mm -hmm. and he wasn't there, and... Um, you had to do it? Yes. Yes, and we have his friend Hassan here, who's um, been very supportive in his life mm -hmm. um, when his mom passed. Have that kind of, have it been an economic hardship on you also? Yes, it has, as um, far as um, paying bills, mm -hmm. um, sending him money for commissary. Mm -hmm. um, it's been a big hardship. And then I took sick. Mm -hmm. So I had to stop working and went on disability, and that made it even harder to try to keep up with the, um, the bills that I had to pay. Mm -hmm. And the phone, the phone, just call, making oh, phone yeah. calls itself and, and putting that money on the phone, it's, it's got to be really rough if you don't have a lot of people in that support network doing that, isn't it true? Yes, it starts off $25 and up for the first Mm -hmm. calls that you put in. I actually have personal knowledge that you have been a close friend of Wayne Bruton's for like years. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And and you since you've been released, you've been very supportive of him. Tell me what you've been doing on his behalf and why. Well, phone calls, uh, contact the people he need. He need me to run. When he went to court, I was there for him. And why is because I myself went to prison when I was a juvenile. And growing up with Wayne inside the jail, you see the change in him. Just like I seen the change in myself, and I know that he deserves some of this, this freedom. Okay, you are married to Hassan that I just interviewed. And tell me how long you've been married to him for the second time. And how long you have been working and supporting him? 
Well, I've been with him for like 38 years. Um, we had been married one time in 1996. Um, we got a divorce because he um, he was granted uh, to come home, but then when they pulled back all the lifers, he was among them. Mm. So he was the one that said, go on about your business and leave me alone. And I didn't do it because I believed in him. Mm -hmm. Um, so since then we've been together. Then he came home in 2013. We got married um, last year and we've been married since then, happily married. When I was in, we had a program called uh, Positive Change. You know, and we was going around the jail, mentoring youth or pick certain youth and mentoring and change their perception. That's why I was called positive change, try to change their perception from negative to positive. Mm -hmm. You know, and Wayne was very, very instrumental in that. And we also wrote uh, a book together uh, explaining our life through the system and hoping that somebody read it and will change their life for some of the brothers that's in there when they go in as juveniles. He has accomplished so much. I'm so proud of him. I don't even know how to tell him thank you for staying positive, for staying success, for because some guys don't do that because they can't adjust to society mm -hmm. like he's done. He then came home. He has a job. He has his license. He has a home. He has a wife. He has kids. He has grandkids that, that loves him. He's just awesome. But do you think those two to three hundred juvenile lifers that's been in there for 30 to almost 40 years now, do you think they represent any kind of danger to society if they're released? No. I, I, I have, um, to make a long story short, I have a son who's a, he's, he's an adult now, but he was a juvenile and he's in jail. Mm -hmm. um, Again, a lot of juveniles, we, we misunderstand a lot of juveniles because a lot of juveniles, they don't need to be incarcerated. They just need a strong backboard, which the system fails to represent them the way they should represent them. They feel as though correcting them is putting them in prison, and it's not. What you're actually doing when you put juveniles in prison, you're either setting them up to be killed in prison or you're setting them up not to be productive. You know, they deserve a second chance. I don't think no juvenile should be given life. A juvenile is still a baby. Mm -hmm. He's, they, they, they have to grow to be a man, and putting them in prison is not going to do it. It's not going to do it. And um, the men who are the plaintiffs in the case, what have they done while they've been in prison you think that shows that they should have this chance? They've met all the basic requirements. Uh, that's required for one to receive a recommendation for parole. You know, however, because this, of the policy that's been in place, none of them have been able to avail themselves of the, the, the necessary programs, uh, such as the work release, family leave, and pre-release system. Do you think that you have taken advantage of all the programs that the prison system offer you? You have went to school, you've done all the self-help and self-improvement program. Do you think there's anything else left in the prison system that can help you? There's nothing left. There's, there's nothing left that I can do. Basically, the, okay. the concept of rehabilitation has basically been obsolete over the years. We basically are uh, no one time. You know, we never want to... Yes, where, uh, you're saying you're just being like, warehoused now? Absolutely. Even when you go in front of case management, uh -huh. the first thing they would they, 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 they would mention to you, well, man, that you're serving uh, a life sentence. There's nothing you can do. You can't get involved in any in, any any programs. All the programs that I've been involved in, we have created. The incarcerated citizens have created these programs. It's okay. not just the administration to get it. We have rehabilitated ourselves. Okay, so uh, last month we did a story uh, when you and the ACLU filed papers and we were waiting for a decision from the judge. Could you kind of like update us? What sure, happened? so 
Um, we have filed suit on behalf of juveniles serving life sentences in Maryland. Mm -hmm. um, the state moved to dismiss the case, and last month there was a hearing on the state's motion to dismiss the case. And mm -hmm. so the issue before the judge was, can the case go forward or not? And um, on Friday, the judge issued um, a really favorable ruling holding that the case can go forward and rejecting the state's arguments that are that the case has no legal merit. I also just want to let you know that there is a hearing on the legislation that's been introduced every year to um, take the governor out of the parole process and restore the final decision to the Parole Commission. Mm -hmm. um, the first hearing um, is scheduled for February 14th mm -hmm. um, at 1 p.m. in Annapolis. Okay, Valentine's Day. Valentine, happy Valentine's Day from Annapolis. Um, yes. Will be the um, the first hearing in Annapolis this year on the bill to okay, take the and that's the first reading to find out if it that's can come the, out of the committee. That exactly, that's the hearing where everybody will testify before the committee as to why they should vote mm -hmm. one way or another. So the public really needs to be down there. The public here if you really have needs to be the, be down there. If you care about this bill, this is a really important day to be in Annapolis. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>